as, as well as a former student and current student. And I'll let him introduce uh, his guests and how he plans to use them today. Uh, Randy's uh, one of our evaluation and assessment faculty, uh, expert in those matters, and is going to be talking to us about the E, meaning probably evaluation in IPT. So, uh, yeah, evil in IPT. Join me in welcoming Randy to our seminar day and his guests. Okay, thank you. Um, we had a, a number of opportunities to speak to faculty or to students in that as faculty. And one of the things that came up was that we realized that a lot of you didn't really understand where evaluation was in the IPNT department. In fact, um, when we, we talk about the E in the ADDI model, it comes at the very end. But I'm going to tell you that that's not really true. How many of you did an evaluation today? Put your hand if you did an evaluation. Wrong. How, all of you should be putting up your hand. <laughs> evaluation is everywhere, right? Where is the E? It is everywhere. Everything you do has an evaluation component in it. Now, it may be informal, maybe not systematic, um, but it, it will be an evaluation component. All of you made an evaluation today about a lot of different things. What you should have for breakfast, what you should wear today, it's really cold, should you wear that, uh, you know, flip-flops and shorts, or should you maybe put on something a little warmer today? All of us did an evaluation of some kind. In fact, we used to have a, when Andy Gibbons was here, we had a little bit of an uh, ongoing teasing rivalry. Uh, he would always say, design is everywhere, design is everything, like, everything is design. And we would say, no, evaluation is everything. And the truth is, we design evaluations and we evaluate our designs. And they're part and parcel. You can't really do design without evaluation, and we have to have something to evaluate, therefore um, they are part of each one. I did bring some guests today. One is missing. Um, one of our students, uh, Delina Tonks, is the principal at Mountain, High, um, Mountain Heights Academy. And um, she is probably the poster child of someone who does program evaluation and has systemically put this into everything she does from curriculum development, uh, all of the decisions that they make about their um, policies and their personnel and everything they, they do, they use evaluation. So although she's not here, I'm going to um, kind of throw in where she fits into this evaluation uh, scheme of IPNT as well. We also have um, Steve. Steve is, well, I'm going to let Steve introduce himself briefly, two minutes, just tell us what you do, and he's one of our esteemed alumni as well. Sure. My name is Stephen Ashton. I'm the director of audience research and evaluation at Thanksgiving Point, and uh, I, I got hired on their uh, part-time about 10 years ago, and I was on the exhibits team initially, uh, doing helping with some of the design. At the time, we were working on the, the Museum of Natural Curiosity, and then ultimately got hired on full-time to be the director of audience research and evaluation. And uh, what was interesting for me, it's, it's um, evaluation is an important part of what I do, but it's, it's just one component where I get to do research and evaluation, where I get to help with design, and at Thanksgiving point, uh, we're a multi-museum complex with five different uh, museum venues. And we feel that evaluation is a really critical part of design. So that gets incorporated in all, all the things that we do. I also really like that I get to be an advocate for the guests. So my, one of my responsibilities is to, to monitor what feedback we're receiving from our guests and evaluating what uh, impact we're having and then making sure that we incorporate that into the designs that we implement throughout the property. The interesting thing about Steve is that, and it warms my heart to hear this, that he values evaluation. <laughs> because when he was a student here doing his design projects, he was adamant and almost resistant to the fact that he was an evaluator as well, because he was an instructional designer. But then when he came back probably a year and a half ago, he actually introduced himself as an evaluator. I'm going, what? Steven, that, no way. He's done in both. He does both. <laughs> but I think he's, he's kind of seeing the light that he can be an instructional designer and still incorporate all of the evaluation aspects that are needed 
in that design process for that. And maybe what Dr. Davies is forgetting, I was in his assessments class and we talked about standardized testing. I was not a strong proponent for standardized testing. I think I was pretty vocal about it. That's true. <laughs> and assessment, as you're going to learn later on, is a form of evaluation, but it is not the kind of evaluation that we typically do um, in all of the aspects of design. It's only one small part. The assessment part is one small part. But our second guest, um, or third guest, second guest is uh, Stephen, or sorry, Jonathan Clark, and he is an EMI student by day and a evaluator by night. He sent me both of these pictures. It kind of resembles, right? Yeah, it looks pretty good. Anyhow, I was hoping he would just choose the second one. Um, <laughs> all right, as I said, my name is Jonathan Clark. I am currently a student in the EIME program. Um, in my second year, and I uh, have a little bit of a background in uh, education policy, research, and evaluation. Um, but currently, I am interning it with Canyon School District over there in Sandy and Draper area, um, if you know where that is. And uh, I am part of an evaluation team. We are part of we are part of the instructional supports department within Canyon School District. Which seems like it's interesting. Um, you would think that we would be along with the assessment and evaluation department, but uh, we are with the instructional supports department because we literally have we we are a part of evaluations for every aspect of this of the education within the district. Um, we, the instructional supports has their hands everywhere, and thus we have our hands everywhere. Um, um, we work with uh, primarily we we do evaluations with everything. Um, and I, I think we'll go into later about what exactly, how they come about and what exactly we do, so I'll save that for later. Okay. Um, the interesting thing about this, and if you don't remember anything else, remember this, that everything that you do in the design process, everything you do in your research, everything you do will have an evaluation component about it. The one thing that um, John taught me was um, that, well, I'm going to save this for his little story later. For that. Let's start here. Um, let's define evaluation. Now, the technical uh, kind of jargon that we use for what is an evaluation, it's judging the merit and worth of something, an evaluand, an object, a thing. And what, what do we, what do we uh, evaluate? Well, we evaluate individuals, programs, projects, policies, products, equipment, services, concepts, theories, organizations. All of this requires an evaluation. Each of those things can be done differently, and, or they use a different approaches to do those kinds of things. They all involve values so that we can judge, and they all, um, the results of these evaluations usually aren't generalizable for everybody in the world, but they are very specific to that evaluation, that situation, that context that, that you're working in. So when we talk to you guys, you how would you define evaluation in your context? So Steve, go ahead and well, John, you got the mic. Okay. How is evaluation done? How is evaluation done? Or so what is evaluation in the minds of your organization? So in our organization, uh, the the primary goal for us as evaluators is to improve policies and practices within the school district. Um, and that, include, that can include any, all of any, uh, any kind of process or policy, uh, from how we discipline students to how uh, a, a large evaluation of the gifted and talented program to uh, just looking at uh, onboarding for assistant principals, uh, or how a certain new curriculum has affected certain schools. All those are, are things that we take a, might take a look at. Right, and so because it's schools, and this is what uh, Stephen was alluding to, um, he resisted the fact that um, standardized testing was the best way to evaluate schools and students and things like this. Isn't am I portraying your yes. resistance properly, right? Mm -hmm. And um, when you look at a school district, you might think that the only thing that they do is look at student scores, because that's always in the in the news. Oh, school scores are down. This school's failing because its scores are down, and it's all about that. But the reality is. When we use evaluation, this 
objectives-oriented kind of evaluation that is focused solely on student grades and whether or not student grades are improving or not improving or whether or not this particular program produce higher scores than that particular program, that's a very small part of evaluation. So what John is telling you is that they do evaluation of a whole bunch of things, policies, products, all of the things that they're looking at, and it has little to do with the assessment or the scores that we're trying to say is the criteria for whether or not something is good or not. There's a whole bunch of other things that we're, we're doing there. Steve, how do you define it in your organization? So I, I feel like um, I get to take on the role a little bit of a doctor. Uh, I, I look at evaluation a couple ways. So one way is as a doctor where you're continually monitoring how things are going. So at Thanksgiving point, we have regular uh, exit surveys that we give to people as they are uh, exiting um, a venue experience, or we'll send them a survey. And we get to track, based on whatever their reports are, we track how well we're doing with the different venues. How well is the Museum of Ancient Life doing, or the Museum of Natural Curiosity, or the New Butterfly Biosphere? But then we also use evaluation to inform all of the other things that we do with design, and with, uh, with exhibits and with programs. So for example, we have lots of uh, outreach programs and lots of field trip programs. So we're always looking at how well are those programs helping us to accomplish our goals of, of transformative family learning and also for uh, connecting up to different state standards and things like that. But then uh, with the design process, uh, we use it as we prototype exhibits and as we um, you know, here's an example of, of something that we did recently, where with the Butterfly Biosphere in our design, we worked with uh, a school up in Salt Lake County, and there were a bunch of kids from, I think it was like, uh, what, first grade to fifth grade or something like that, and we tasked them with the idea of, if you were to design a butterfly experience, what would it be like? And we used a lot of their designs and evaluated what they did, and got feedback from them that incorporated we incorporate that into our formal design and in the actual building of the butterfly biosphere. So it was a really critical component. Okay. There's probably two things that you may have missed with what they're saying. First of all, is that many of what, especially what Stephen's doing, is context specific. So within this environment of a museum, they have certain criteria and they are based on values that they have, right? So one of the values I know that Stephen has is for the museums at Thanksgiving Point, they want it to be family friendly. It has to be a family experience. They want it not just to be for adults who are going and looking at art or whatever and the kids are saying, Dad, let's go to McDonald's or whatever, but that they go together and that they're exploring and experiencing. Yeah, that is what we call a values, or sorry, values. Um, value is different. So when we talk about the differences between these two things, about to have something have merit or worth, that means it's of value. It can be used to do something. But your values will determine the criteria that you use in your evaluations in that you have to decide what's important for you. So you could have something that works, but you wouldn't do it because you don't value that or you don't you don't feel that that's the right way to go, even if it does produce results. For instance, you may design into your instruction daily beatings of your children to make sure that they're obedient and placid and sitting in their chairs properly, right? And it works. I mean, behavioral, um, behaviorism does work, right? So your punishment, reward, stimulus, response, all of those kinds of things, you can get those kinds of things, but there are people who don't value that. They value a more um, comprehensive look at the individual and building self-esteem. And, and so they wouldn't do that kind of approach, even if it did have value in that it did work. right? So you've got lots of museums out there, but they may not choose that approach because they value something different. And they would choose a different approach to doing something because of their values. The values determine the criteria that we have. To have something that works is important. But you also have to consider, is it the way that I want to go about doing this okay. for them? Can, can I give an example of that, Randy? So um, a few years ago, we decided to conduct an economic impact study to see what impact we're having with the economy uh, within Utah. 
Uh, and this was all in an effort to be able to get more support and more funding from policymakers and other sponsors. So we contracted with the firm, and that, uh, after a short while, this firm said, you know, you ought to consider conducting a social impact study at the same time. And so we, we worked together actually with the MPA department, uh, Masters of Public Administration. Uh, there was a professor there that they recommended. We worked with her and with some of her graduate students and put together a plan that we used to demonstrate the value of Thanksgiving points socially. And so as I look up here, like, okay, what is, what's the value? What's the value of Thanksgiving point? We're making meaningful contributions to the community by supporting families and that leads to these other long-term impacts. But then uh, Thanksgiving Point has a set of values that we strive to, to follow, including this idea of we want to cultivate transformative family learning. So we were using those values to help us understand, um, to help us craft that social impact study that we were doing. Eventually, we completed the study. We were really happy with the results. We shared it with the Utah Division of Arts and Museums. And they said, let's, let's expand this and let's start to use this uh, across the entire state and try a pilot with several different museums. So we did that, uh, but we had to adjust some of the things that we cared about at Thanksgiving Point weren't things that were necessarily applicable for all other museums. So we had to adjust our logic model, we had to adjust some of the values that we were focusing on so that the study that we did was more broad and generalizable <coughs> for different museums. And so if you didn't catch that. So one would have been the economic value. So does it work? Like I value economics, so does this give me good economic value? That might be one approach to yes, this does or no, it doesn't. But another value that you had was social impact. Does this improve the social impact of the community? And so both of those are not the same, and depending on what you value would necessarily look at the criteria that you're looking at for evaluating, does it have value? Is it useful? Is it working? Does it accomplish the goals or the values that I have? Or does it complement those values? And that's what we're looking at here. Okay. So next question. Well, what is educational research and how is it different? Quite often, this is where John's story comes in. Quite often in my evaluation class, I try to make the, uh, the distinction between this is research this is evaluation, right? And I was always trying to kind of figure out, well, how can I explain these differences between this? And I would say, well, evaluation is more broad and research is just one component of it. And, or they're side by side and they kind of share tools or different things like this. And so I had in my uh, program evaluation class, which I'm gonna pitch later on that all of you should take, um, <laughs> is John, I interview all my students, and John comes in and he sits there and I said, so how do you see this? He says, well, I disagree with you. He didn't say that. He said, well, I see it this way. And he said, do you remember what he said? Not this time. <laughs> <laughs> he said, it's really all inquiry. So there is this inquiry that we're trying to do. We're trying to learn things. Inquiry is the bigger, broader umbrella. And research and evaluation are different aspects of it, and they, they kind of do it in different ways, and they approach it differently. So if you look at a common a definition of systematic investigation of educational issues, and you're looking at usually generalizable results in research, right, is what you're doing, where in evaluation, typically, we're not so worried about the generalizable results, although we do find some often. We're really looking at contextual improvements to a specific object or a object, uh, the product that we're creating, the program that we're trying to implement, whatever it is for that as well. So when we look at these differences between evaluation and research, because all of you are thinking, well, I'm doing research, this is where both are a form of inquiry. I actually learned that from John, thank you, John. Right? Um, so both of them are forms of inquiry. In fact, Richard may tell us this. E-I-M-E, -E, Educational Inquiry, Measurement, and Evaluation. Why didn't they talk about educational research? Richard, you might have to grab a mic and tell us this. The short version of that. I cannot give you the real answer.
But inquiry is a, inquiry is used in that context as an umbrella that encompasses both research and evaluation and measurement. So they wanted that broader thing. Maybe that's where John got it from because he's in the EIME program. We originally proposed to call it educational research, measurement, and evaluation. Oh, Richard, don't give it away. You're getting tempted. <laughs> you can tell. I'll leave it at that. Okay, <laughs> the, hidden, the hidden message there is that there is a tension between what we might call researchers and evaluators, right? And that, and we'll go into this. It's the same tension that we find in a lot of different things. I call it the quant call wars in some ways the quantitative researchers versus the qualitative research. There was that same kind of uh, tension between the two. And some people would say, no, you need to do it. You know, uh, Statistical empiricism is the only way to determine whether or not something works or not. And the qualitative people would say, no, there's other ways to do, determine this kind of thing. Um, and this causation question, all of those tensions are, are there. But the thing that they have in common is they're both forms of inquiry. They're both systematic. And they both provide evidence or information for us to be able to make decisions, make improvements, do whatever it is that we're going to do. So how do they differ? Well, research typically values generalizability of results. They're looking for something that is a, a solid, factual evidence that this will work. Now, some will debate whether or not research does actually do that because much of the research that we do isn't uh, reproducible. You can't replicate it. Or if you do replicate it, you, get to, you try to replicate it, you get a different result kind of thing. But that's the, that's the thing here. How they are perceived in academia. Research is valued highly. Evaluation, not so much. In fact, there are many people who adamantly believe that a dissertation could not be an evaluation disagree, but others have their own values and, and perceptions on that. Um, they, they see, and if you're trying to publish an evaluation, well, that's another thing. That's harder to do. It's hard to publish an evaluation because people say, well, how does that, is that, that's not generalizable to everybody. That just works for your little program or your museum or your school district. It's not going to work for everybody in the world. Well, you know, um, there's still value in understanding how it works in these contexts. And then that is somewhat generalizable, especially if you uh, look at enough of those kinds of studies. Research uses designs, and evaluation uses approaches. So when you do research, one of the things that dictates whether or not you have a good research project is that you use an appropriate design. So the What Work Clearinghouse, one of the criteria for judging whether or not you've got good research did you use an appropriate design? Did you carry it out properly? That's kind of the quality of the research is based on did you do it right, right? Where evaluation uses approaches. Approaches to how can we get the information that we need, and it may vary. In fact, even the people who uh, pr promote specific approaches in evaluation generally say, well, we don't adhere to this absolutely all the time. We're a little more eclectic. We do what's needed to get the job done. We may have an approach that's focused on a certain thing, but if we need to do something different, we will change it and do it differently. It's much more adaptive in that way. Um, the pervasiveness of the activity, um, I can't even remember what I, why I wrote that down, but it was really <laughs> important at the time. I'll split to the immediacy. How, how long does it take to get something published in research? Some t it's never like a week. I mean, a year, six months to a year is not unheard of, and if it goes past that, you'd better be calling up the editor and saying, hey, what's happened to this? Did you lose my paper? Um, quite often, those research publications that you get won't even be see the light of day for a year or more, and then the people that get access it have to have access to that journal and then they have to read it and see the benefit of it. You could actually spend all day reading research papers that are already published and there are lots that aren't, and you still wouldn't get all of the research read that might be pertinent to what you're studying. There's that much of it out there, right? 
When you talk about evaluations, these are more immediate. So as you are conducting an evaluation for your own designs or for your museum or for your school district, you find that out immediately that information is given to the clients. The clients use that information to immediately use it to improve their situations. So the immediacy of that uh, is, is there. Oh, I know I have the same pervasiveness. When you do research, usually it's quite focused, where uh, in evaluation, it's much broader. So we're not just usually looking at the impact of something, but we're also looking at the unintended consequences of that. And we're also looking at other aspects of this. So for instance, when we do a program evaluation in a school and saying, um, does this improve test scores, right? That's the impact kind of question. But we might also say, are teachers implementing this as intended? If they're not implementing it as intended, how are they implementing it? Why aren't they implementing it? How are they changing it? And that would be an evaluation component attached to that research that we have there. And then, so the questions that we ask are slightly different. And the way that we ask those questions are slightly different. Yeah. Do we have time for a question? No, we don't have any time for Yes, Steve, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. I can wait, but. <laughs> Just teasing. So one of the important issues you talked about a few slides ago, a little bit ago, had to do with values especially with regard to evaluation, but none of your bullet points here have to do with value. Did you, could you comment on the differences in how they treat values or how values might be involved or anything else? Because that seemed like that's kind of a big deal. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so how, how the difference between how research, what researchers value and what uh, evaluators value, is that the question? How values might be involved at any level, Yeah. You know, like however you see it. Right. And so I'm not suggesting that research are godless and they have no values. Right? That's not what I'm saying it's at possible, all. possible. Right? It's possible, but it's not true. Um, what people value differs in research than in an evaluation. So when you, when you talk about a researcher, one of the things that they value more than the evaluator is the generalizability of the results. That's one thing. So they, they value that. That's their values. I want to find something that will change the world kind of thing. It's not quite put that way. But they're looking for something that is uh, a, a theory or something that's going to be the, the standard or the, the bedrock for building on whatever it is that we're doing. Right? So when you talk about all of the theories that you have in educational, um, in, uh, in education where you're saying, well, here's this theory, here's this theory, those were built on research and we're finding we're trying to find these generalizable things, and that's a value that they have. So when they find a theory that works, that's, they value it, right? Because that is going to inform our practice, and that's a really important part of what we do. I'm not saying either that research has no value, right? Because there is important value in research. But evaluators may, well, and in many respects, some of the researchers do funny things so that they can do evaluations without being called out as not being a true researcher. So when you say something like action research, do you know what action research is? Action research isn't really research, it is evaluation. Action research is more of a genre than it is a design. So when you say, I'm going to um, conduct a um, random controlled trials with treatment and control groups and that's a design and I'm going to design it this way and I'm going to do this. But when you say action research, it's more, look, we have this problem, we're going to try some things out, see if it works, evaluate it to see whether it solves our problem. We may not know why, it may not be generalizable, but we're going to do that. Another one, um, a good one, is um, design-based research. Design-based research, I can't remember the name of the guy who came and talked to us about that last year. Bill Pengwell. Yeah. So he came and, and I was talking to him and I said, so why did you call it this? And he says, well, because we were getting pushback and then they were saying that it wasn't real research. So we had to change the name to make it have the word research in there so it would be more acceptable. And I said, well, do you know that this is, you're doing this evaluation technique or this approach and that you're doing these kinds of things. All of these things are principles in evaluation. He says, yeah, but we've got to call it a research because it's got to be acceptable to this, this group. And I think both researchers and evaluators value the, 
the potential for research to have an impact on our lives. And they also, the researchers evaluate or sort of look at evaluation and say there's a need for this as well. Maku. So this might be a cynical question, but why don't evaluators just start using the term evaluative research or evaluation research for what they do? We do. We do. When we want to get published, we say, um, this is evaluation research. <laughs> And so that it's more palatable, you know, it's like uh, names and labels are important because they bring in connotations to people. And so you, you might say, you know, um, I don't know, you, you might call something, um, I don't know, I don't use mustard, I use grape capone. Well, that's mustard, right? But this is, a, this is a, something much better than just regular mustard kind of thing, you know, and so the names, the labels that we use on things are important because people will, without knowing, reject what it is you're doing unless you um, play in that sandbox and you talk that language and you understand where they're coming from, what their values are and, and what's important to them and then, yeah, you can do evaluation research. That, that's kind of what we're running into right now at Thanksgiving Point. We're in the process of seeking a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. They're the federal funding agency for both museums and libraries. And they have a research category for their grants. And this social impact study that I was telling you about, we want to make it a field-wide study where we're uh, studying a lot of different museums and the social impact that they have. Well, really, it's, it's kind of an evaluation project on a broader scale. Whoops that we hope can be made generalizable. So it's definitely, it's, it's a little bit in that fuzzy area, but we have to talk about it in a way that says that we're doing research. And we are, we are doing research, but there's definitely very strong evaluation components all throughout it. So they're doing evaluation research. <laughs> and to make it palatable. It's kind of like putting ice cream on your mashed potatoes so you can delete it. My mic is turned off. Uh -oh. I'm back on. I went dead for the other day. That's all right. I did a Zoom conference for one of my students the other day, and I forgot to unmute my mic. And so she was just sitting there watching it, not hearing anything the whole time. That doesn't work, by the way. Just so you know, research shows that if you don't hear the video conference, that it's not as effective as if you can hear the video conference. That's kind of like saying people who jump out of airplanes without parachutes are more likely to die than people who jump out of airplanes with parachutes. But we kind of know those things. All right. Let's talk a little bit about um, this, and I'm going to get our guests to talk about it. Where's the E in IPNT? Where's the evaluation part in IPNT? And like I said earlier, it's everywhere. We don't call it evaluation always. We call it other things, but it is still an evaluation process. For instance, in a needs assessment in 662, we talk about, or 661, we talk about this. When you have a product, you have to make an evaluation of whether or not there's a need for that product. What gap is there that would cause us to want to have this product? Is there a gap? Your needs analysis is an evaluation, right? When you talk about your task analysis, how are we going to accomplish this? You're doing an evaluation of sorts. And when you're looking at your um, tests and your assessments, you're doing an evaluation. Are our learning outcomes being met? To what degree does this facilitate increased understanding as measured by these tests? We're doing an evaluation. It's more narrow but it is an evaluation. When we look at the um, design-based research, like I said, that is evaluation. It's an evaluative process. It's an iterative process where we try things out, we evaluate them, and then we ch make changes and see whether we can improve it and make a better product. And whenever you do any of your product development, even though if you were espousing the ADDIE model, the E comes at the end of ADDIE, then you just don't do evaluation at the end. You're doing evaluation all the way through that process. All of the decisions that you make about the um, media, the platform, the message, the content, whatever it is that you're doing, you're making evaluation decisions. 
you're saying, this is what we're trying to accomplish. What is the best way to accomplish that? And you're making decisions about that, and you need information to do it. Whether or not you call it evaluation or not, it is an evaluative process that you're doing. And if you do it systematically and thoroughly, you'll probably have a better product than if you don't do it that way, right? If you don't test it out, if you're not looking at uh, those kinds of things. I'm going to um, talk to each of you, and you can decide who wants to go first, but how does evaluation in your organization work when it comes to designing things, but also in improving your programs? Uh, so, um, I'll give an example, and that's uh, every year we have some big events, and two of our biggest events are the Tulip Festival that has, happens in the Ashen Gardens every springtime, and then we also have Luminaria, which is our Christmas light walkthrough experience also in the Ashen Gardens every wintertime. When we, uh, when we started, well, Tulip Festival's been going for a long time, but Luminaria's been going just for a couple of years. We decided a couple of years ago to, to do a very concerted effort to evaluate how well those events were going. So of course there's all the operational factors that they're looking at with the revenue they bring in and the number of guests and things like that. But then I was tasked with putting together a, a survey that we use for evaluating the guest experience. And so we now, uh, we now have a dashboard, we use Qualtrics, and, and Qualtrics has the dashboard capability so that we can look at every single day during the Tulip Festival. We can say, okay, our, our scores, our net promoter score was this on this day, and we saw that parking was a big issue, and this, uh, with this other thing was a big issue, but the flowers were in bloom, and so people were still having a good experience, and we're able to look at that and we've given that dashboard access to lots of different people in the organization. So our operations folks, our guest service team, our education team can all look at that and can use that to help them make better decisions on how to implement the, uh, how to implement the Tulip Festival, for example. And again, we're doing that with Luminaria so that every time we can say, okay, what is it that guests enjoy the most? What do they enjoy the least? How do we, how do we improve the experience so that guests are more likely to come back and more likely to purchase memberships and things like that. So, so the evaluation is really closely connected with operations and with design and with, um, and with all the other things that we're doing at Thanksgiving Point. Um, okay, so I've, I've been involved in several evaluation projects this, since starting at Canyons and um, one of the the one I think might fit what we're talking about right now the most is, uh, for example, the uh, principals have approached the, actually, this happened, started before I got this, so I'm not sure who approached them, but um, there was a discussion between the evaluation team and the principals in the school district, and they said, hey, we, um, there is, uh, we're, we're trying to find a better way to provide training so that our assistant principals are better trained so that they can fulfill their job better. I'm not sure if that was a, a slide, a, a slide, a, a slide. This on the right. On the There's no panel. politics in evaluation. <laughs> it's all very objective. Uh, but I lie. <laughs> they wanted us to take a take a look on the onboarding process and see how the district can better facilitate better By training. By onboarding, you mean hiring? Hiring. Sorry. Okay. Just so you do the lingo. Hiring process for for new assistant principals, and uh, that include that so for. For our job as an evaluation team was to figure out um, what the system principals are expected to do, what they're being trained to do, um, how their jobs are actually panning out when they when they get there, uh, whether they believe they've been sufficiently trained, whether the principals think that the system principals have been trained, and and um, all, all these different series of questions. My specific job has been mostly the data, data analysis part, um, but. Another example, I, I can give you a lot of examples, I'm not sure. <laughs> sure, another one. Um, okay, another one. Um, we are, we, we're, we were approached as an evaluation team to talk about, to look at the discipline data within the school district to see how, um, if, how, how, okay, hold on, I don't know the research questions down here. One of the main questions was, um, are certain groups being disciplined differently than others? by, by um, gender or race, and um, 
are, are disciplines happening more frequently in certain certain schools, certain levels of schools, elementary, middle school, high school? Uh, which ones are being referred to law? Which ones are being led to uh, leading to suspensions? And are those groups that being acted? Uh, is that happening differently among uh, different subgroups? Um, with the overall question of how can we better facilitate uh, the discipline process and, and know how we as a district are um, handling all the different various discipline issues. So those are, are, are two examples of um, times where the evaluation and team has been involved on the processes of just within the school district that has nothing to do with um, the end of year assessments. Okay. I should probably jump in a little bit and say, you know, in practice, evaluation, when you get a job as an evaluator, you're not, these two actually have evaluation in their titles of, of what they do, but a lot of people won't have evaluation in the title. In fact, I tell the program evaluators that if you want to go into administration of supervising and doing things like that, you may not have the term evaluator in your job, but it will be part of your job description you will be evaluating a lot of things. You will be evaluating personnel and their performance, policies, how things are working, um, user experience, all of those things you're gonna be doing as part of your job, whether or not you're using, um, you have the term evaluator in your uh, job title. You could be an internal evaluator, which is kind of like, it's part of my job description, but I'm not called an evaluator. Um, or you could be an external evaluator. An external evaluator usually comes in because somebody values two things. One, that they don't trust the people in, even if they do trust the people inside the organization, there has to be the perception that somebody else outside without bias is going to come in and do the evaluation for them, which is kind of laughable because we all have biases. You know, everybody has a bias, and it's just being able to understand what your biases are and to be able to um, adapt or at least report less in a less biased way um, for what it is that we're doing. I often laugh when I read some of my students' papers and things, I will say something like, your bias is showing, meaning that you're writing in a way that it's obvious that you're um, pushing for one point or another and you're not balanced in the way that you're, you're displaying or, or giving this information or you're unbalanced in, to this one or you're disrespectful to this one and it's pretty obvious in the way you're writing. So when we write, and as a value, this is one of the challenges, is to respectfully and accurately report differences of opinion and different perspectives of the various stakeholders that you have. That's a skill that an individual who does evaluation has to have. Researchers don't have to have that. They're trying to be more objective, but they also have their own biases as well for that. Hey, Randy. Yeah. Your mic is off again. Again? All right. It's on now. Okay. Um, before I, I give these guys the last uh, question, which is what advice would they have for you, um, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, we, 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 I think you've alluded to it several times, some more directly than others, but um, can you speak to the issues of evaluation as a means of evaluating the program and evaluation as a means of appealing to stakeholders? Um, how often do you catch yourself, or how often do you end up doing one rather than the other? Would you rather do the other? And then um, yeah. how does, just kind of that general issue of politics and complexity of organizations involved. Yeah. First of all, um, Daniel Stuffelbeam is someone who's written a lot about evaluation. He's one of the people who established the standards for conducting evaluations and uh, he's retired now. But he would talk about, and there's two questions that I'm going to answer here. He would first of all, talk about the ghost in the system. And then he would talk about uh, quasi-evaluations. So the ghost in the system, when we say that we're evaluating a program, we're not really evaluating the program. What are we evaluating? We're evaluating the people who carry out the program. We don't tell them that because then they get nervous. But, so we'll say something like, oh, don't worry, we're not evaluating you, we're evaluating the program. But reality, it's how you implement the program. That's what we're really evaluating. 
So there's always that, but there's that political aspect of how you portray the evaluation, how you carry it out, being respectful of the individuals, being um, you know, mindful that everybody has different values, perceptions about how things are working. The second thing is the quasi-experimental, or quasi-evaluation. If you are doing an evaluation for the purposes of trying to appease a certain stakeholder, that's what Stuffelbeam would call a quasi or a pseudo-evaluation. A pseudo-evaluation is worse than a quasi-evaluation. Quasi-evaluation would just be, we didn't do it comprehensively enough. A pseudo-evaluation would be, we're just giving you the result you want to hear. If you're doing that, it's not really an evaluation. You're just producing a report for someone and getting paid for it. And what do you want me to write? Okay, I'll write that. That's not really evaluation. Um, a pseudo-evaluation is something you should avoid. A quasi-evaluation is something that isn't complete enough. So you're only looking at one aspect of it. Some evaluators will criticize research as a quasi-evaluation in that the focus is so narrow that it's not looking at all of the aspects because teaching and learning is a very complicated issue. There's lots of factors that uh, determine the degree to which it will or won't work for different stakeholders. And so when you're just looking at research based on its impact or objectives, does it increase test scores or something like that, they would say that's too narrowly focused. It's quasi-evaluation. But it's important, but it's too narrowly focused. You should also look at, are they implementing it? How is it being received? What unintended consequences are happening because of what we're doing? All of those things have an impact on, and whether we realize it or not, we are um, impacting all of these other factors other than just the narrow criteria that we're judging something from. You know, something I, I want to add to that is uh, we have a vision statement for the audience research and evaluation team. And we, we kind of, uh, this vision statement is, is a lot about how we are here as internal evaluators to serve the rest of the Thanksgiving Point organization. So our, our number one goal is to say, what is it that you want to know and how can we help you figure that out? But at the same time, while that's the goal and we, and we share that with our senior management team and other managers to say, what do you want to know? How can we help you? We also take it upon ourselves to make sure that we have an understanding of the best practices, the current uh, trends that are happening in museums with evaluation and research so that when someone says, yeah, we want to understand this a little bit more, we can say, okay, you want to know that, but here's what's happening in the rest of the field. Here's what we think, we, the tool that we ought to use to understand this so that we're both answering your question and making sure that we're evaluating it in the way that is the best practice and the most useful, not only for us, but then also is beneficial for others. Um, we're about out of time, so I'm going to give you guys last say. What advice would you have for these students in terms of evaluation? <clears throat> it better be good. No. <laughs> That's political. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, I guess the first thing that comes to my mind is, is to recognize, take, take seriously the idea that evaluation can be part of every single step of whatever you're designing or whatever you're studying or, or uh, of anything. Um, the uh, saving an evaluation for the end doesn't make sense when, when you when you are thinking of um, it, it's a little too late kind of attitude. Um, you, you discover when you, when you get to the evaluation mindset that when you have that mindset at the beginning is what's most helpful. A few of my thoughts, uh, even small evaluations can make meaningful differences. Uh, and then I also, I, I noticed, so I didn't spend a lot of time when I was in this program focusing on evaluation, but I, I did a lot with design and with research and I felt like a lot of what I learned there is really applicable for evaluation and vice versa, where a lot of the methods that you would use for research you could use for evaluation, a lot of the design ideas incorporate evaluation. So my, my thought is, my advice is just enjoy learning and, and think about ways that evaluation can tie into whatever it is that you're learning, whether it's evaluation, design, or research. So the last thing I'm going to make a pitch for as we end, because 
Jason just stood up, that means we're done, right? Uh, I did a quick evaluation and I saw that and I thought, what does that mean? Anyhow, um, we changed the program recently. 661 is now product evaluation. It's very applicable to um, designers because you're designing products and that process of evaluating throughout the design is really important in all the different aspects of how you do evaluation. But there's a 761 course, which is program evaluation. Not a lot of you are going to take that course, but you should. Um, it helps you look at the broader aspect of evaluation, how it's done in all different kinds of careers and different kinds of a setting and using all the different approaches and ways that you might use evaluation. So my pitch for you is don't just stop at 661, get on to 761, especially if you have any ambitions of doing something in more a supervisory role or you feel that whatever job career that you're going to get is going to involve that, which it will. So take 761. That's right, it. Thank you.